Uh, right, okay, so uh, good morning and welcome to our latest virtual bridge session. And today I am extremely, as you know, James, <laughs> extremely happy to welcome you to today's session as you're jumping in to cover for someone else at very short notice <laughs> on, on the subject of how you put together particularly engaging PowerPoints for remote delivery. Um, and you're going to talk us through some of that process today. So without taking up more time, over to you, James. Thank you, Kenji. And that was a really nice introduction. Thanks. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, one of the things that I've learned over the years is um, something called the cognitive theory of multimedia learning and especially something called the modality effect. And you might have heard of this. This is where our working memory Loosely speaking, psychologists form it into the visual sketch pad, they called, and the phonological loop. So this is where it's audio visual. So it's split into two. So when we learn and it's stored into working memory, we've got our visual sketch pad, which takes in graphics, information, and text is also part of that as well. And then we've got the phonological loop, which is about hearing, so narration. So there's really three ways that I use PowerPoint. So one of them is to, as a lot of people do it, is to convey simple information, bullet points. So this is key deadlines, key dates. It's static. It can be printed. Uh, it's to be read uh, one after the other in a linear fashion. Another and one, the most common one is a live session where I'm narrating over the top of my PowerPoint. Now, this is probably where I use almost no words. I use only narration on top of graphics and images and included in that are uh, a quick I'm a maths and numeracy teacher so including that are graphics and that's pretty much because of this modality effect if we overload our students with too much graphics and uh, so for example when students see words written on the screen in a powerpoint presentation they're reading that in their head and that is also using up the phonological loop because they actually hear that when we all read well, I do anyway, and most people do. We, we read it in our head and we can hear it. That is actually using up that working memory as well, according to psychologists at least. So when I design PowerPoints, and I'm actually giving a live lesson, narrating over it, so making use of this modality effect, I try not to have too many words. I just have graphics, and I try to use my narration to uh, emphasize things. And that's so we don't cognitively overload information for our students. And now what I'm going to show you today is I adapt that live narrated lesson by adding the text and making it completely interactive and completely standalone. So I use the slides that I've created for the live lesson. And then what I've done is I've removed the narration and I've added the text. So the text is replacing my narration. And there's many advantages to this, which I'll discuss uh, as I show you. So I'll just share my screen, share my PowerPoint with you. And if anybody's got any questions while I do this, please just let me know. Okay, <clears throat> hopefully you can see this. And I'll just go to reading view. Okay, so first of all, the design principles I use for all of my slides, I have a very simple design. So I don't have any frames. I don't have really, I don't really play around with themes. I just have to make it as simple as possible. This includes the color scheme. Um, this includes the layout. And this also includes things like how big the text is, the font. And that brings on to the accessibility as well, because I want the students to be able to read it. So I try to make the, the font readable. I try to I make the language as simple as I can for the students. Uh, and I also, a key, a key point here as well is that I don't overload my slides with too much information. I just have one key point per slide. So in this example, it's totally interactive. So this is, I save this as a slideshow and the students can open this in Microsoft Teams and they can access it on their mobile. They can download it and they can use it offline. And this is really good for people who are, uh, can't get a good internet connection. So maybe they can't come to your live lessons. They're working asynchronously from home and they've got this. So, and they're, and they're engaging with it, it's interactive. So what I've done is I've included um, an enter lesson button here. So this is just the front page. And then I'm showing them, you enter it and this is a navigation tool. So there's navigation all throughout this. So they click on the, the enter the lesson 
and we've got the introduction to number to, to rounding numbers. All right, brilliant. So the students go along with this, and now this is the first part. What is rounding? And I would do this in a live lesson. I would ask them, okay, what is your question? What is your answer to this? What is your definition to rounding numbers? Now, bear in mind, this is in the context of decimal places, in the context of level three, level four numeracy. So the definition I've got here is uh, in, related to that. So I'd maybe ask in a live lesson, I'd ask students this, but here I would just get students to click, think about it and then click to reveal the answer. Rounding is the reduction of the number of decimal places in a number. Now again, strictly, that's not the strict definition, but in the context of this lesson, that's good enough. Okay. Now this is where I come to some graphics. I have the number line. The number line is animated. And now I've got what is the number in the middle of one and two. And I've got a little countdown timer. And then there's the number. Then I'm asking the question, where would 1.3 go? Now I can tweak the timing. So I probably would uh, tweak this timing to be maybe a bit slower. So it gives the students a bit more time to think about that. So I can show you how I do that. But here we go, where would 1.3 go? Any ideas where 1.3 would go? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so they can click next and then 1.3 animates on the screen and then I tell them 1.3 is between 1 and 1.5. Now again, I would tell them this in, in a live lesson. I wouldn't have the, the writing here. So they click next. So is this closer to 1 or 2? And now they come to a low stakes task that they can answer. So there's absolutely no pressure on them to get this right, but it's simply enough that they should be able to look at the diagram and go, okay, 1.3 there is closer to one. So they click closer to one, and it says 1.3 is closer to the one two. If they click two then got it wrong, I don't tell them, no, you got it wrong, big red cross. I want to raise their confidence and I want to build that up in them. So I just tell them 1.3 is closer to the one and two. Again, so this isn't a long one, so um, if we want to round 1.3 to zero decimal places, okay, so they read that next, comes up, we would round down to one. Now this is where I have a little animation. So I've got a little uh, person here, and this is an analogy. This is like a, a visual metaphor for how we actually round. So they get to click this, and then I've animated this man pushing this down to one, so they can see that it was 1.3 when we're rounding. We're rounding down because we're going down to one, because one is less than 1.3. So that's kind of a visual representation of that. Now, I'm asking them the same question, but in a different way. I'm telling them that 1.7 is closer to two, and now they've got to tell me Will they round up or down? And this is another low stakes question that they can click and interact with. And obviously from this, we're gonna round up. And again, I'm gonna get them to click this to so they get the person to push the 1.7 up to the two. So we're rounding up. So it's quite a nice, gives them instant feedback, it gives them uh, engagement and uh, gives them a bit of interactivity, which is a little bit of fun uh, in this process. And now we say, have a go at a mini quiz to check your understanding so far. So if they feel they're ready, they get to go to a mini quiz and I've embedded Microsoft Forms, a little Microsoft Forms quiz into this. So they get to um, answer these questions and submit them. If they're connected to the internet, um, they'll get this. If they're not connected to the internet, then this will just be uh, a blank screen. So if you want to have this and they're connected to the internet, brilliant, because then I can see their answers and I'll get information from that. And Go, we'll press next and that's pretty much it. That's one of the lessons that we have and these are just credits. And by the way, the icons that I have, if anybody's interested in icons, um, you can go to the noun project, which .com and you can get icons. Microsoft Office has a set of them, but for ones that uh, you want, go to this website, it's brilliant, as long as you credit the artists. Okay, so, Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, that's just, this is just one way that I use PowerPoint. Um, again, I've, there's different ways that I use it, but this is one that I've used with my low level students recently. And it seems to be, and one of the things that I've, information I've got from students is that textbooks 
Some students like to just read textbooks and work that way, but they're in the minority these days. And learning chalk and talk style lessons seems to be um, becoming less desirable. Students are wanting more interactive content. They're wanting more so interactive content like this, interactive presentations and explainer videos. So I could create a video of this, record it, and then give it to them as an MP4. So these two things actually is what they're, they want. And they want to be able to access it on their phone or their tablet or the laptop rather than having a textbook with words. So I think having this alongside traditional methods is uh, what students need. So anyway, I do ramble a lot, so I'm just trying to aware of time. What I thought I would do is go through another slide. So I'll create another slide and maybe show you some of the functions that I've used here, some of the ways that I've done this. So if I go to this and I can just press, okay, let's go to new slide. And what I'll do in the last ones, I've used one uh, to zero decimal places. Now let's increase it and give it a bit more difficult. So up here we've got shapes. And again, I do realize some of you will be like, this is too simple then. Okay. But you know, hopefully, hopefully people will maybe pick something up. So you go to these shapes and you've got the lines. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down shift because that makes, that gives me a straight line. So it's at 45 degree angle or a horizontal angle, zero degrees. So let's just go with that. And I'm going to still highlight it. I'm going to make it quite thick. All right. So let's just say that's the number line and I'm going to copy it. And these are just some of the tricks that I do to, to speed it up. I'm going to make that a bit smaller and I'm going to rotate it because that'll be my end like this. And it snaps to the center and the, the symmetrical points on this, which is really unique. I'm gonna copy and paste, keyboard shortcut. Okay, so this is the end of my number line. And now I'm gonna insert my numbers. So I'm gonna to go to shapes again. And I'm gonna to go to this text box here. So this is text box. And I'm gonna just drag now I like the equation, I like numbers in the equation. So you can just put like 5.6, that's fine. That's no problem. Or if you want the equation, it's you hold down the alt and equals and you've got your equation editor there. So let's just put five point, let's go 5.6 right there. I'm gonna highlight it and I'm gonna increase the size of that. <clears throat> okay, I think maybe 36 would be good. Okay, so the next decimal place up from that, I'm just going to copy. And most of this is copy and pasted. Like, once you know where to go, a lot of this is pretty straightforward. So that's going to be 5.7. Okay, and now in the middle, right bang in the middle. There we go. We're going to have 5.65. All right, so what I want is I want the slide to come to this and I want this to animate. And the animation isn't necessary, but it's just visually appealing. So what we can do is I can go to animations and I can go to this wipe. And the effect options up here, I want it to wipe, for, wipe from left to right like this. So this is the number line. And then straight after that, I'm going to have the 5.6. I could have this floating in at the end, and then the 5.7, I could have that also floating in. And then I want this to happen successively. So I want the line to come in without me having to press any buttons to go to the next slide. So I'm gonna click on that, and up at the top, I've got on click, well, I want it to act with previous or after previous. So this automatically does the animation as soon as the slide um, transitions to this slide and then you can do the same for these so I want this as well after previous and I want that after previous so this should all happen successfully and I'll just demonstrate that so if I go to reading view and it does me it does it without me having to do anything and obviously I haven't done the 5.6 yet so I can just uh, let's just fade it. There we go. And I'll go after previous as well. And you can play around with the timing as well. So you can play around with um, the delay, the duration. I won't mess around with that just yet. 
So now I want to ask them, where would 5.68 go? Okay, I'm gonna to go to the text box again, and I'm just gonna drag this, and then I'll say, where would 5.68 go on this line? What I'll do is I'll just center it, and I'll increase the font size up here. Okay, so I've got, and I want this to happen um, after this as well, so I don't want the student to have to click to navigate to that. So again, I'm gonna put the animation, I'm gonna wipe it. And what I want it to do is I want it to wipe. So if I press the wipe, you'll see that it, and I go from left to right, you'll see that it does it all in one. It's like just one continuous wipe. I want this to wipe letter by letter, so it looks like kind of it's been written on the, the slide. Um, makes easier to follow. So I'm gonna click on this, and I am going to go to effect, uh, I'm gonna say animation pane, and I have to move you guys. Okay, so the animation pane, and I'm gonna click this, effect options. Down here we've got animate text. I don't want it all at once, I want it by letter. And then this is delay between letters, and I add a 20% delay. And what you'll see is now it comes up like this. So it's a bit easier to read, I think. Okay, and so what I'll do is I'll add a box, and we can say, um, okay. I'll, so let's get, add something that they can click, an answer that they can click, so it triggers uh, another animation. So I'll have a box here. And let's just, in fact, I'll change the color so it's something a bit lighter. Let's go for that one. And I'll put this, um, let's say between, whoops, between 5.6 and 5.65. So that's the wrong answer. And again, I'll just increase the size of that. And I could move that up a bit. And I'll have the second option between 5.6 and 5.7, which is the right answer. Okay, so now I want the students to click on this. So I'm going to click on this one here. And I am going to, aha, well, before we do that, we want the animation, we want the 5.68 to animate. So I'm just going to copy that. And I'm gonna get rid of the animation for now and I'll call that 5.68. And I'll make that a different color so we can see that it's um, different. Yeah, we'll just go with that. And I'm just gonna put this about here. It's not perfect, but that's probably where it would go, somewhere about this. And I'm gonna animate this. And it doesn't really matter. I kinda of like, I think the grow and turn is pretty good. Nah, it doesn't really, it's, it's a design choice, I suppose. And what I want to do, I want that to trigger. So I'm going to go to trigger, and I'm going to put this, and it's going to trigger on text box, which is this one, I believe. So that animates once that has been clicked. So what we do, hopefully this will work. Aha, what I need to do is I need to animate these into being. I can't just have them from the start. So I need these to not be from the start. I need these to come in sequence. So I'll just fade these in. And this is, so you can see you've got zero, zero, you've got one, two, this is the sequence. Or you can see the sequence from the animation pane at the right here. So what I'll do is I'll do this after previous. And now what we have, and again, I think this one would be after previous as well. So they all should be zero, but they all should be in order. Let's see if this works. And again, a lot of this is kind of trial and error. Hopefully this works. And there we go. So I need to figure out the trigger there. So the trigger for this would be, 
Aha, it's one of these. There we go. I got the, the box wrong. That's the thing. You got to sort of play around with it so you know what the trigger is. So let's do this again. So it's coming up and we have a question. Okay, there we go. And now you can see that hand has appeared. And when they click on that, it would appear on the line. And again, you know, that's that one slide and I can improve this. I'll tell you what I'll do. One thing is good is I'll show you the navigation. So I'll just copy and paste these. In fact, no, I'll, I'll just do them. So for the navigation, this is what I did, which is quite helpful. And the reason I've added navigation is you can use your keys, you can do the swipe, but if the students um, don't know this, they could navigate and it would interrupt the, the flow. So if I tell them when to navigate, then it becomes a lot easier. So I've just gone down to a sort of arrow connector um, for this one. Uh, okay. We could just even do an arrow. And we could go next, next slide, for example. And if they want next slide, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to insert, and here we have action. Now, this is quite a new feature in this, which I think is brilliant. And then you go to hyperlink, next slide. Simple as that. And you can do one for the previous slide as well. So I hope this is helpful to people. <laughs> okay, we click on that, then I've actually done the wrong one, haven't I? I've just realized that. <laughs> All right, that's what happens when I'm trying to teach <laughs> as well as that. Okay, and then they go to the next slide. Okay. Anyway, there we go. I hope that was uh, helpful. There's a few different features. If you want to do Microsoft Forms, then you've got the Microsoft Forms that you can insert there as well. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily have all these features when I'm doing a live demonstration. I would simplify it and I would just narrate over it because I don't want to talk on top of them reading things. But this is to be self-contained in a package. And the idea is to have simple design, simple animation and transitions with a purpose rather than just for the sake of them. Um, yeah, okay, hopefully that's been helpful to people and I'll open it up to any questions. Okay, thanks James. Um, yes, animation. Um, I, I'm sure there will be more than a few questions. Um, let, me, let me just put us back into the gallery view. But um, I suppose my question to begin with um, is, how how long does it take you this this will be a popular question how long does it take you to put together um slides for say a typical one hour session well i wouldn't do a one hour slide um let's just take that example the example of the lesson i've shown you there on rounding i um that took me what that probably took me five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe at the maximum. So that 10 minute, five, 10 minute slide took me about um, half an hour to 40 minutes to make. Now that is after me using PowerPoint for a long time. Um, mm. So a lot of the features and a lot of the functions, they're all automatic for me. I don't need to think about where to go to find them or what I want to do. And a lot of the time I just start with a rough idea of what I want to do in mind. And then I just start placing things and seeing where it goes. And that process itself can be hit or miss. I can get maybe a few slides in going, oh, actually I've got a better way of, of presenting this. So let's start over. So with that in mind, it can take a while, but if you've got a clear idea of what you want to do, then the learning curve is known where all the functions are and how to use them effectively. Like the navigate the animation panel I, that is something I didn't really use until I started to know, okay, I want to animate um, them in sequence and I want to get the, the timings correct. I want that to happen after this. And it's like, how do I do that? Ah, the animation pain, because then it's all in logical sequence. And but Would yeah, you so, say that you've, you've got a lot faster? Like, so from when you started out with PowerPoint and you started delving into animation options? Absolutely, you, you absolutely. You managed to speed up the process quite a bit just as you got more familiar with it. Exactly. I think it's like a lot of things, you know, 
especially software, because PowerPoint is really awesome in what it can do. Um, and if you just want to use it, like how I sometimes use it, just to informate, like convey bullet point information, then you don't, you're not going to think about the animations or anything like this. You just use the built-in animations to, to do that. But when I started to make videos and wanted to present more animated graphics, or I had various ideas, I basically played around with it quite a lot. And then I started to realize that actually PowerPoint has a lot more packaged inside it. And I think that can be quite overwhelming to start with. If you to say, like, I'm a bit aware that showing people this might be like, oh goodness, that's, that's too much. But really it's not, it's, I incrementally got there. It was built upon simple steps that have suddenly, instead of me trying to think about it now, because I've done them so much already now, I know where to go for them. And that has taken um, quite a bit of time to get to that point. And by the way, I swear, I'm not an expert. I'm still learning and I'm still, you know, there's probably loads of stuff that people here could say, ah, oh, James, you should do that. And I'd be more than happy for people to do that. Okay. Um, does anyone else have some questions for James about his, his slides and his use? I've got a quick one. That's, yep. uh, yeah, so there's obviously like so many buttons and options available on PowerPoint up there. And even as you went through that, and I've been using PowerPoint for more years than I care to say, uh, then, and, um, and even today's been a revelation in ways of thinking about um, in presentation. Animation should be more than just the striptease of bullet points. Um, but are there any other little tips and tricks you could uh, give us as to what you've found looking through as you, you know, you've obviously explored in much more depth? Um, yeah, so um, off the top of my head, I use, because I teach maths, I use the equation editor quite a lot. And when I use the equation editor, now you, you don't have to type it in latex, you can, as Kenji showed me, you can actually just write it in pretty nicely with a with the mouse. But the transitions of the morph, where I want to show where a certain part of the equation comes from and how it morphs into the next part of the equation or how it blends in it's got a really nice transition of the morph transition um so that's i think the transitions can be used for um to good effect as well uh, but you've got to use them with a purpose if you overdo it you're gonna overload it um in terms of general tips and tricks honestly i think i've refined the design part is like I've only gone on the research that I've done on like educational tech and psychology of design. And I think when you're conveying information and I do know this myself when I was a student and, you know, seeing other people's PowerPoints, when you have graphics with lots of text and you're presenting that information and reading that information, narrating it, it causes, especially if what you're seeing doesn't quite match up with the text, there's a, a cognitive overload there that students have or a bit of dissonance and that can actually be a barrier for the students so my recommendation if you're using powerpoint in that sense is again just take away the the, the words and just or just have very or don't have words too too embedded with the, the images an example of this is um and i'm sorry i'm going to use the example of maths here if we've got an, an image a diagram of say angles and we say, okay, this is angle A, this is angle B, this is angle C on the diagram. And then next to it, we have angle A equals 68 degrees, angle B equals 70. The students are having to look at one, then look at the other, then look at one, and then they're trying to correlate. You best just put in the, the key information on the diagram because um, it, it flows nicer and it makes it easier for students. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if I've answered your question there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we have time for one more question, um, if someone has a question for James, and we will continue the conversation uh, afterwards, but just for the purpose of the recording. Can I ask, are we going to get a copy of the recording sent to us? Uh, oh, I, I can answer that. So all Virtual Bridge sessions are recorded and made available on YouTube. Um, so I, I'll pass on the, the link to all of our, I think now 70 plus uh, videos uh, that are on YouTube and, and you can watch them all at your leisure. <laughs> that, that was a very good Virtual Bridgey kind of question. <laughs> Does anyone have a last question for uh, James um, just before we finish up? 
He likes tough ones, by the way. Just just to add that in. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I think just to finish up in the 30 minutes, uh, we'll, we'll just, for those of you watching via YouTube, uh, <laughs> we'll have to bring the, the recording to an end here, but we'll continue the conversation on in here. So the next time you have an opportunity and you're able to join a live uh, virtual bridge session, please do. And uh, we would look forward to seeing you then. But until then, <laughs> stay safe. Thanks, James. <laughs> Thank you.